Hey friends, welcome to week three of Your Own Image. I have my head-on selfie here and I've printed it with an inkjet on Strathmore 200 watercolor paper. This is my least absorbent watercolor paper. I did not want the inkjet ink to soak in right away the way it would on like the cotton business paper that I used in last week's lesson. And on my brush here, I have loaded it up just with water. There's no paint on this brush. So I am using that water to manipulate the ink that hasn't even had a chance to dry yet on this watercolor paper. And this is a super fun technique to use for any piece you might want to do with an inkjet printout. It doesn't have to be a selfie. You could do this technique with anything and turn it into a watercolor by manipulating that ink with just a brush full of water. Of course, there are also apps that will give you a watercolor effect or a painted effect on your photos, but I find that the filters that come with those apps are pretty predictable and we end up with a uniform look, whereas I wanted just the unpredictability of actual painting. So that's why I'm using that brush. It's a very, very thirsty brush that holds a ton of water. And it's really interesting to see which inks it activates, which parts of the dye ink come out when you activate it with water. Like this area that I'm working in right now is a pretty warm area, but it's activating some green ink. So it's like I'm bleeding some green into it from my sweater. And then it's also activating the green in that light warm area of the picture. My favorite thing to do with this technique is to put down a big puddle of water in an open area without many details on it, and then come up to a very dark area with lots of ink and connect those areas with water and then get a beautiful bloom of color into that puddle that I put down. And you can see how I did that with the area around my hair and the area around my sweater. I got a lot of good blurred edges and blooms into those spaces. Now you can absolutely let this sit and air dry, but what I like to do is bring out my heat tool and when I have a lot of puddles on something, I like to move them with the air from my heat tool. So you can see that these puddles of color are moving around my paper and that's going to leave little streaks and a lot of texture and interesting features in these backgrounds. I took a great course over on the Jean Oliver Network called Scribblepedia by Ray Missigman, and in that course she showed us how to do this exact technique using ink and a heat tool. And with the diluted inkjet ink and these colors, it just kind of gives a nice subtle effect to the background. I've left my face nice and clear on this. I have not brought any water into the face. And now I'm going to start cutting pieces out and isolating different features. So I'm starting with the biggest pieces, which are these background areas and the area on the lower portion around my sweater. As I get into the face, I want each portion of my face and each area to be isolated and separate. So two separate eyes, the nose, the mouth and chin, and then my hair. And as you end up with these individual pieces, you might actually play with rearranging them and forming sort of a cubist portrait. I'm getting my art journal out and my secondary image source, which in this case is a really great find that I came across at a library book sale. This is the shell guide to some of East Africa's flowering trees and shrubs. I can't find the publisher year on this one, but it was reprinted in 1981, so definitely falling into the vintage category. And as you can see, it is full of full color illustrations as well as photographs. And I really enjoy these illustrations because they go from being finished full color paintings to line sketches in the same image. And it's a really cool effect that I wanted to use. So I'm taking some of the photos and I'm taking some of the sketches and I'm going to combine those. 
Now last week I recommended that you use collage elements you create yourself and that fit into the same color scheme in order to make your finished collage more cohesive. And by the same token, to make your collage for this piece more cohesive, I do recommend using just one source for all of your non-selfie images. So if you can find a great book that covers all your needs the way this one does for those images, then go for it and just stick to that one source. Part of the fun of working in collage is finding images from different places that work really well together, but that can also almost be a hindrance in some cases and can stop you from creating a collage you really like because you're so focused on trying to make these pieces work together. So this is just one way to take the pressure off of yourself. It's just an easy way to end up with a cohesive collage. So for sourcing books like these, I definitely recommend library book sales, estate sales, little free libraries, yard sales, thrift stores, absolutely anywhere where you can find quirky old books. And to be honest, I am not really a florals person in general. I don't paint florals or work with flower imagery for the most part, but I couldn't resist these images. They were just so appealing to me. we're going to arrange these pieces into a layered composition and I have used one of my watercolor background pieces at the bottom here and then two of the floral pieces in the background as well. Now I have done some test versions of this page using an acrylic background the way we did for last week's piece but I found that it was just too much when you worked in all of these images that we're using. A lot of the images are very dark in value and when you add an acrylic background, it just overwhelms it. So it was too much to work with and I decided to keep the background completely blank to make it minimal and keep the focus on the actual image pieces themselves. So now I'm auditioning all these pieces and trying to find a composition I really enjoy. And I am working with multiple layers again. I'm trying to find some little pieces to come out and add visual interest like this yellow one coming out from behind my eye here. This is a really fun opportunity to play with that composition and to form some shapes between those pieces that are interesting and dynamic and that will draw the eye around your page. Last week we were working with words in our collage, and this week we are not. It's completely image-based, so you have to keep the eye moving and have to keep the viewer's interest, even without words for them to focus on. So I've ended up with this triangle arrangement between these three fronds or sprigs, these illustrations, and then that's going to draw the eye down, because the longest one is at the bottom. Meanwhile, in the top half of the image, we have my eyes, and even in like a painted portrait, the viewer focuses on the eyes. We're very drawn to those, so that's going to help keep the attention in the top half as well. So I feel like it's a pretty balanced composition overall. People are going to see and notice every part of it, and I'm pretty satisfied with the way that these pieces work together. One of my favorite things about this piece is the little bits of the fronds, the little leaves poking out from the layers, and also the fact that this euphoria sprig over on the right side really nicely matches the color of my hair in this image. Now we're going to begin the gluing process, and again, a glue stick will work just fine for these pieces. I am once again using regular matte gel, and I could be using one of those special spatulas specifically for art, but instead I went out and got a $2 silicone spatula that works exactly the same and was a lot cheaper and is exactly the same thing. So never underestimate the usefulness of regular kitchen tools in your art making. I have a piece from my background here that has a really nice range from the lightest color down to the green that almost matches the darkest parts of my sweater in that image. And I decided not to use the actual darkest green parts because they would easily overwhelm the photographs and the images that I'm using in this piece. And this is also the scrap that had probably the most texture from those watercolor effects from moving the water around while I was drying it with my heat tool. 
So at this point, I'm just putting things down in the spots where I had aligned them when I was auditioning each part. And you'll see that that is a little bit complicated when you're working with so many different layers that are all sort of interlocking and intermingling. And I had to put down a couple pieces that were an upper layer in order to find where a layer underneath them would fit and then go back and glue that layer down. All of which is to say it's just super important to audition these pieces first and know exactly where each one will go before you commit by gluing them down. I also really ended up enjoying the moments where I had pieces down that were around my face like my hair here and my collar and neck. And uh, I think later on I'm going to do a collage piece where my actual facial features are approximated by images of other things. So instead of actually having a picture of myself, I'm using other images to make up those shapes and to look like my facial features. And I think that would be a really fun project. I mentioned earlier that I'm not usually into florals, and I just want to assure you that if you're also not into florals, this is not a project that requires florals. I think there are a lot of different opportunities out there for imagery to work with that is in different categories and different sets of things. Like, I think technical blueprints would be a really cool use of this theme. Or if you had an art supply catalog using paint brushes for these same sort of fronds sprouting out of your face would be a really interesting alternative. Anything that offers that variation between these little details and then the larger bits of texture and pattern is going to work great for this project. And like I said, I went through several versions of this page before I landed on this one that I really enjoyed. So don't be afraid to print out a lot of copies of your selfie on the watercolor paper and do a lot of those textures and try a lot of different versions of these intermingling images. I'm a big believer in the power of doing a particular piece of art more than one time, especially when it's made up of elements that you can create more than one copy of. I think our culture has us convinced that anything we create has to be perfect the first time, especially with artwork, because we have unprecedented access to other artists' creative process via things like Instagram and, of course, YouTube. We can see people's works in progress and their process videos and things like that. And we don't think much about the fact that, of course, the only thing that anyone wants to actually put online is the work that turned out really well. Very few people show their first drafts or their massive sketchbooks of preparation and study. And even when you yourself are an experienced artist, it's very easy to fall into this mental trap where if you create something that can't be displayed because it's not up to your standards, therefore you're a failure because you created something you don't want to show someone else. It's okay if it's just for you. It's okay if it's a learning experience. It's okay if you deem it a failure. As we all struggle for views and subscribers and monetization and popularity, it's easy to lose sight a little of the practice of making art and what makes it an actual practice. There's a reason we call it that, you know? There's an old fable about an emperor who commissioned a great artist to paint him a chicken. And months and months went by, and the emperor kept asking the artist, how's my chicken coming? And the artist said, oh, it's going great. It's going great just a little bit longer. And the emperor was like, how's my chicken coming? It's been like six months. And the artist goes, it's great. It's coming along great. You'll have it really soon. And finally, the emperor gets fed up and goes to the artist's house and says, okay, where's my chicken? And the artist sits down and pulls out a blank sheet of paper and paints the emperor a chicken right there. And the emperor's like, well, why did that take so long? And then the artist pulls out dozens upon dozens of practice paintings of chickens and says, that's why. My point is don't neglect practice and don't mistake practice for something other than what it is. It is just for you. A lot of times I'll watch people's sketchbook flips on YouTube and I always enjoy these videos a lot, but sometimes I'll see somebody flip their sketchbook and there are no bad pages in it. And I think to myself, okay, where did you hide the pages that you tore out of your sketchbook? Nobody is on 100% of the time. Nobody has 100 good days in a row like that, especially not in a medium like a sketchbook, which is meant to be for practice and for rough ideas and rough sketches of things. 
but it's totally natural to curate after the fact, which is what I do in my art journals. I will fill a book, and sometimes I only have three pages in that book that I end up liking. I learn something from every page, but I don't want to keep every page. So I take out the ones that I like, and I put them in a little portfolio, or I put them in a separate book, and that way I don't have a shelf full of books that only have, you know, a dozen pages between them that I actually want to look at ever again in my life. But if somebody were to look at my curated art journals of those pages that are only the pages I like, they might actually get the wrong idea and say, oh, she was on every single day. Every time she sat down at her art journal, she created something awesome. Anyway, comparison is the thief of joy, and please just keep in mind that when you look at an artist's output on social media, on Instagram, and on YouTube, that is curated. That is something they've practiced and worked towards, and it's not what they just sat down and did on the spur of the moment, for the most part. There are people who do sit down and do that on the spur of the moment, but if you're watching someone's process videos, it's a sketch that they've practiced and worked on, and they've perfected the composition, and they've probably done a test painting or a test collage to make sure that they really do like the idea and that it's going to work well on camera. And this piece right here is no exception. Like I said, I went through three different drafts to get to this point right here. This was the version that I wanted to show you. I was very, very happy with the results, but I wanted to add just one more finishing touch to this piece. So I went and got one of my white markers. This is just the kind that they sell at Michael's in the pen section, and it is not perfectly opaque, and that's just fine. So what's going to happen is that because I have not sealed my inkjet printout with, say, cold wax medium or a workable fixative or anything like that, that white paint from the marker is going to soak up a little bit of the dye ink. And also for the same reason, you can see a couple spots in my printout where my glue actually reactivated the dye and I have darker spots. So when this ink gets reactivated by the white paint, it is going to soak a little bit into that, and these dots that I'm putting down are going to fade just a little bit. They're going to soak up a little of that ink and get closer to the color of the ink around it. It's going to make for a more subtle effect on these patterns that I'm putting down, and I really enjoy it. So I'm starting with some rays coming out from my right eye in the cardinal directions, and then I'm going to move over to the left eye and trace around that, as well as bringing out a couple different features on my face around the eye, and then the nose and also the mouth are all going to get this pointillism treatment. Again, this was a piece that I just didn't want to overwork that much. I had done so much to it in previous versions. So just to add a little bit of pattern and texture in the face was the perfect touch for me to finish it up and the rest of it could remain very minimalist and very simple. Again, because the white ink does soak up some of that dye ink, it is important to clean off your white marker on a piece of scrap paper regularly. My matte gel is still a little bit wet so I could pick this piece up and reposition it just slightly so that my eyes would be a little more even and put a little more gel on it as well to hold it down all the way. When you're auditioning your pieces, pay special attention to the arrangement of the eyes because if you tilt them just slightly towards each other in one direction or away from each other in the other direction, you can actually get different expressions. You can make yourself look very forlorn or even a little bit devious. So here's my finished page. Again, I'm very pleased with how this version turned out, and I hope you enjoy playing with these layers and incorporating different images into your own deconstructed image. Next week, we're going to use a full body selfie to create our very own paper doll. Thanks for watching. <laughs>